Hi everyone, it's Sarah who uploads Better Youth on YouTube. Just wanted to say how lucky are you to have Andy, Andy and Carol as your Better Youth leaders. Hope you enjoy this week's Better Youth. Hello and welcome to Beta Youth on All Saints Day. Not the school, but in honour of all the Christian saints. Why aren't there many card games in Africa? There are too many cheaters. Why is an elephant's skin so wrinkled? Well, it takes too long to iron. What is the lion's favourite food on safari? baked beings. On what day did the lion eat most of the tourists? Tuesday. Sorry, these are awful, aren't they? And it's not really true about lions eating people, well, very occasionally, but generally they're not interested. I am, of course, talking about Africa here. I have a deep love for Africa, its beautiful natural environment and its people. One great African who achieved enormously in his life was Nelson Mandela. He did and said many amazing things. One quote is, It is what we make. out of what we have, not what we are given, that separates one person from another. Our theme today is Out of Africa, and I'm going to do this in two parts. 
and I ask your forgiveness that it's a bit longer than normal. The reason is that I'm doing the reading and thoughts first, then I hope you don't mind if I tell you something about a year of my life, living in Africa, working voluntarily in schools and hospitals, mainly with children with disabilities. But first, our reading is Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Later, God's angel spoke to Philip. At noon today, I want you to walk over to that desolate road that goes from Jerusalem down to Gaza. He got up and went. He met an Ethiopian eunuch coming down the road. The eunuch had been on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and was returning to Ethiopia where he was minister in charge of all the finances of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He was riding in a chariot and reading the Bible, the prophet Isaiah. The spirit told Philip, climb into the chariot. Running up alongside, Philip heard the eunuch reading Isaiah and asked, do you understand what you're reading? He answered, how can I without some help, and invited Philip into the chariot with him. The passage he was reading was this, as a sheep led to slaughter, and quiet as a lamb being sheared. He was silent, saying nothing. He was mocked and put down, never got a fair trial. But who can now count his kin, since he's been taken from the earth? The eunuch said, tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or some other? Philip grabbed his chance. Using this passage as his text, he preached Jesus to him. As they continued down the road, they came to a stream of water. The eunuch said, Here's water. Why can't I be baptised? He ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, and Philip baptised him on the spot. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of God suddenly took Philip off, and that was the last the eunuch saw of him. But he didn't mind. He'd had what he'd come for, and went down the road as happy as he could be. Philip showed up in Azotus and continued north, preaching the message in all the villages along that route until he arrived at Caesarea. I love this. Great story. Notice that Philip didn't argue with God. He went straight away, even though he must have thought, why would God ask me to go to this desolated desert road? However, it just so happened that the Chancellor of Ethiopia was travelling home on this road with a head full of questions at the same time as Philip was there. In case you don't already know, Ethiopia is in the northeast of Africa, a large part of what is known as the Horn of Africa because of the shape of the coast. This man was the Chancellor which means he was very important, in charge of all the money for the country. He was also what is known as a eunuch. <laughs> this means he had had his unmentionables removed. In the ancient world, it was thought that men were more reliable and safer if they didn't have amorous urges. <laughs> Perhaps they were right. Now, this Ethiopian was riding as a passenger in his chariot, having come from a pilgrimage, and he was reading the Bible, Isaiah chapter 53. I would recommend you read Isaiah 53. It gives a clear prophecy of Jesus' life and crucifixion, written nearly 600 years before. We are told that the Holy Spirit told Philip to jump onto the chariot. Just think how strange and potentially threatening this could have been. How would you feel? if a complete stranger jumped into your family car while you're travelling away from home. But not only did Philip have the faith and courage to do as the Spirit led him, the, Othi the Ethiopian welcomed him as he wanted someone to help him understand what he was reading. I think you might be surprised how much and how many people ask big questions about the things that really matter. Everyone has a world view whether religious or not. A worldview offers answers to four necessary questions. 
origin why we are where we come from meaning why we are here morality how we should behave and destiny what becomes of us we have been recently talking about the human heart and i suggest the deepest longing in the human heart is answers to these questions if you have faith in god and jesus and if you have an opportunity to share this with someone else please don't be afraid god will be with you through his holy spirit and help you know what to say however although i'm certainly not the best at this i would offer some advice don't force it people will probably know if you're a christian and they will look to your behavior more than what you say for evidence but answer their questions if they ask be honest and don't be frightened to say you don't know if you don't as with philip in this reading listen first to what the other person is saying or asking don't rush in like a bull at a gate because you feel nervous the more and better we hear what other people are saying to us the more and better they will hear us perhaps most important don't be ashamed to confess your faith in christ jesus who crucified yes you might get a hard time from some people and sometimes people go into denial and may even get aggressive but your reactions to this will be noted by other quieter observers philip did all this so effectively that the ethiopian stopped the chariot and asked to be baptized there and then we can only guess the impact this all had on the future but ethiopia now has 63 percent of its population as practicing christians and this is not just in name but also in real actions in the bible ecclesiastes 11 chapter, verse 1 it says cast your bread on the waters knowing that god is faithful and in due time and in due time your investment will return <laughs> stop 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 sorry i pressed the wrong button <laughs> i'll say that again cast your bread on the waters knowing that god is faithful and in due time your investment will return you never know the long-term effects of what you say or do for good or for bad i love africa although it faces incredible problems and it has been exploited and basically raped by europeans arabs and its own leaders it is a truly beautiful continent continent with truly amazing people i spent nearly a year of my life in kenya in 2011 2012 living in a place called chigoria on the foothills of mount kenya most of the time being the only white face for about 100 miles and i'd like to tell you something about my experiences if that's okay i have to make another apology first i have overdubbed the images that follow with my narration and no matter how hard i try the timings keep changing so the words may not all be in sync with the pictures okay yeah in 2011 2012 i spent best part of a year in kenya in an area called meru district a town called chigoria and i want to tell you a little bit about this the background why i went what kenya is actually like why i went what my goals were and what progress i made with that the outcomes and perhaps what still needs to be done so why did i go well lots of reasons life's got to be fun you've got to take a few risks life can be hard and you've got to get your way through that and if you sit on your backside all the time and don't do anything then life's pretty pointless and there are always obstacles there's always things getting in the way especially people telling you things you can't do but with god's support there's any no obstacle you can't overcome and be yourself i wanted to be myself not the same as everyone else stand out from the crowd do something different 
and I really believe in being determined. Not necessarily to get your own way, but where you know God wants you to do something, go for it. And I think we all want to help others if we possibly can. And I felt perhaps going to Kenya, I might be able to help others. And I've done a lot of previous international work, uh, especially with street children. This is in Calcutta. I went there a couple of times and in Romania and indeed in Kenya. And I just wanted to continue that. And I've also done a lot of work with learning disabled. I used to run a lot of Dartmoor trips when I taught at Way Valley, lots of trips, adventure weekends, and we'd take Wyvern students with us and everyone benefited from it, both mainstream and those with learning difficulties. And this speaks for itself. And when I was in Kenya, my particular aim was working with people with disabilities, especially learning difficulties. And I'm a Christian. And God is love. And if you love God, then inherently you love others. And I wanted to try and reach out with some of God's love to help those who were really in need. Have you got it yet? Look beyond the obvious. See the bigger picture. No, it's not the numbers. It's the words. There's a T missing in mistake. Right, from now on, all the pictures were either taken by myself or by someone with me. And to start with, this is the obviously the classic Kenya everyone knows about. Um, this was in Samburu National Park. Wonderful place. And the lioness here took the impala. We saw it take the impala and then she carried it to her cubs. And that, I saw a lot of wildlife. It, it was beautiful. And the people were beautiful as well. The Samburu um, tribe, and they dressed up for us. They danced for us, just like the see, may have seen on the television with the Maori people jumping high in the air. Very tall people. And they took us to their mud hut village. And then at the end of the day, after getting money from the tourists, they take these outfits off, put their western clothes on, and go to the town Archers Cross where they lived. And this is my mum. Uh, she came over for a month to spend with me, and she's looking up to the peak of Mount Kenya. Now, Mount Kenya is the peak of Mount Kenya is actually the highest point on the Earth in terms of distance above the centre of the Earth because of the way the Earth is shaped. And um, we're at a place called Bandas, which is very high and it's very difficult to breathe there, but extremely beautiful. And the drive of my life in terms of risque, get it up there and my four-wheel drive Pajero. The children. Kenyan children are amazing. They're very beautiful, but they're also very innocent and charming and not hesitant and scared like I'm afraid so many in the West are. And they they just, they're happy. I know the little girl on the right there doesn't look particularly happy, but yes, they're nearly always happy. And the, one of my students, when I was in sixth form at Budmouth, did a massive research onto why the Kenyan children are so happy and it would seem British children are so unhappy and I'm afraid she was proved right and the evidence overwhelmingly proved the big thing was contact with nature. And this is one of the schools, can't remember the name of it, I'm afraid it's the highest school on the mountain. Uh, Mr Jolly there, the head teacher, what an amazing guy he was and there's all his students, he was the only teacher there and all these kids and they love going to school and they work so hard and you can see the poverty. So many of them haven't got anything on their feet. But they're happy. They love school. They love life. And here's me working with um, Wiru Secondary School with their older students. And in the church there, did a presentation on, on learning skills. And they sat for four hours in the baking heat and hung on every word I said. It, it was almost embarrassing. They were so well behaved and so keen to learn. Another thing which you probably won't like, but I thought was brilliant, is the Kenyan kids, they clean their own school before the start of the day, um, and they're proud of it. They take great trouble with it, and um, it really matters to them. I think we should do that here. I mean, we wouldn't see so many people drop in litter, would we? 
And they love their traditions and their culture. They're very proud of their culture. And I got involved with the um, song and dance um, festivals. And the lad on the right there, I can't remember his name, I'm afraid, but he's hard as nails. You wouldn't mess with him. Just the fact he's dressed in pink is just traditional. And, um, well, that was something else. And I got very immersed in the community. It was great. I went to lots of festivals, mealers, wedding here. Um, sadly, many funerals, lots of deaths through poverty and HIV and other diseases. Um, I dread to think what it's like at the moment with COVID. But the community, there's a real communities. They really cared about each other and they really celebrated well together. And church. I've spoken to a lot of churches and they're packed. Everybody went to church and most of them really meant what they were doing. They didn't just go for the social thing. They went because they were genuine Christians. And there's my mum again uh, with Mary, who I'll tell you a bit more about in a minute. So Kenya, my, my, the words that stand out for me, communities, they look after each other. They care for each other. Values. They care about the things that matter. They care about the, th the, the values that, that carry weight. Their faith is active. They don't just say it. They don't just go to church. They live it. And their culture, massive culture, wonderful culture, and they, they're they proud of it and they, they indulge in it. Respect. Respect for each other, respect for themselves largely, and respect for their environment. And I have enormous respect for them. And as a result, I'm very privileged to be able to say I've got a number of friends who are still friends now as a result of this. But there was a problem, and this is mainly the problem I went over with. Um, a traditional attitude towards disability, negative attitude. They saw it as a punishment from God, a shame on their family. And the children with disabilities were hidden away. I'll tell you more about Dennis, the appalling picture, in a moment. My goals. When I went to Kenya, the main reason was to work with learning disabled. I managed to talk 24 members of staff, including the head teacher at Budmouth at the time, to um, cycle from Land's End to John O'Groats. And the money we raised, we, we created the school, the Donna Kelly unit, it's called. And um, we had 18 um, young people who came there, not all so very young, I suppose. And, um, well, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Here they are with Erica. Erica's an ex-pupil of mine who came over to spend some time, spent a month with me. Um, she's now a full-on full, full -on nurse, a sister, I think, a ward sister in London, doing extremely well. And there they are. Aren't they great? And here they are. This is Big Martin, Carol, Derek, Mercy, Boniface, Dinah, Eric, Fiona, Kelvin, Martin, Maureen, Rita, Kenneth, Brian, Esther, Eva, and Jane. And those wonderful faces, doesn't it say it all? And here we are, we've got Kenneth, a 14-year-old teaching a 36-year-old how to write. And they loved coming to school. They, they were learning disabled, but they were still really clever and they did really well and they worked so hard. And they were genuinely learning disabled. And here we are doing some maths. And Again, they're so good at maths. And, and it, it's a bit scary, perhaps, for your generation. These guys might be competing against you on the international market in adult life. They work hard. They are desperate to escape from their poverty. They really put themselves out there. And, and, and they love learning. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is a living saint. With Carol, on the left here is Mary. Mary Moriti who was the teacher. Now, I managed to come to an agreement with the Kenyan government. We created the school and provided all the resources with the money we raised, and they paid for a teacher. And this is her, Mary. She has just retired after a wonderful career, and she has done so much good. A lovely, genuine Christian woman 
who has been here actually on an exchange visit and we all fell in love with her when she was here. There are angels on this earth and she's one of them. Right, they all have their stories, these kids. This is Kelvin, you saw him earlier. Kelvin, till the age of 13, believe it or not, had never met another child. He'd been hidden away on his shamba. Now, shamba, tiny little farmstead with a couple of huts they live in and perhaps somebody to keep some chickens. And if they're really well off, they'll have a cow and they'll grow a bit of coffee or some tea and some maize. And Kelvin had no, virtually no communication. Well, no, we got him to say a few things, including his name, while I was still there. But he had no social skills, no understanding of other people at all because he lived alone. He lived with the chickens, basically. And here's a tragic story. A wonderful young man, Derek. Derek, um, Down syndrome, but he was br quite bright and he was the leader of the group, unacknowledged leader. Um, not through bossiness, just because he was such a lovely personality. And we all loved him to bits. And one day he came into school, obviously in a, in a dreadful mess. And me and Mary managed to get it out of him that he'd been raped by his uncle on his way home from school the night before. Now he walked six miles every day to school and I was infuriated with this and took him immediately to the police station and the police weren't interested. So I took him to the hospital, I ended up having to pay £50 to have a check done on him. Uh, that's, that's what it's like, it's, it's terrible. You know, you wouldn't pay a penny for that here, but £50 to have a doctor certify that he had actually been raped took it back to the police and they still weren't interested they did nothing about it and he had to continue walking backwards and forwards those six miles every day to school with this horrible man i don't know if he attacked him again but not while i was there but oh, it, it done bear thinking about okay lots of stuff one of the key factors we had in going i had in going there was to work with the local people there to try and educate the local people to change their attitude to disability and we had many big festivals and fates and occasions this obviously was christmas we had uh, over a thousand perhaps two thousand people turned up for this and amongst it we did a pantomime you see some someone sent me a father christmas outfit and we gave the kids gifts they'd never had a gift before of any description and they were just blown away by it. It was wonderful. And you see the hats. So they were knitted, I think, by uh, the mother of Sally Horrell from St. John's Church. And uh, all sorts of things. It was just stunning. And, and we really do believe we made a difference. Attitudes did change over quite a wide area. And the Donna Kelly unit, we won as the award as the best special needs unit in the district. Which is great until you realise there are only two in the whole district and there's so many children in need there are now at least six but then there were two and here they are aren't they great loving the bits and the great news is that these guys every single one of them have now moved on in their life and are living independent lives and i understand that they're happy and they're all adults now of course this is eight years ago um wonderful wonderful i'm very well i'm proud of this to be honest uh, but it's not just me it's many people all at the behest of the lord god okay sorry about this appalling picture i took this picture uh, it shocked me to the core when i found this this is dennis dennis till the age of i think it was seven was fine until he had malaria malaria attacked his brain and it destroyed him Dennis, from that point on, he's in this picture now, he's 14. He had spent seven years of his life in this same position, although I just rolled him, me and me and Catherine had just rolled him, because his mother knew no better, and she had no money. His bed was this sack you see him lying on. The nappy is something we just provided. His only communication was to scream when he was in agony, which I'm afraid was quite a lot. And he was locked into this same position he, he couldn't straighten his legs he couldn't straighten his arms uh, we were able to help we provided mattress obviously and bedding and good quality food and clothing and, and nappies and goodness knows what else but we, we tried other things as well 
we took him, and this is Rachel, who's my niece, Karen's uh, daughter, and Georgia, who's a physiotherapist, and we took him to a local pool, well, a local, it was miles away, but um, uh, to see if anything could be done to help loosen up his limbs. Unfortunately not. Um, he ha remained in this position until three years ago when, sadly, he, he died. Um, again, I, I firmly believe that God will look after him, but what a tragedy. And through lack of education, through poverty, and when you think of the wealth of certain people in the world and, and the opulence of people's lifestyles, and you see this, then I think some big questions need to be asked. Okay, and here we are. This is Dennis again with his mum, who is no longer with us as well. She died of cancer. She died after Dennis, but she was an amazing woman. She loved her son, and she worked so hard. She tried so hard. Um, well, I like to think that his last years were more comfortable than the previous seven had been. Let's tell you a happy story. In the picture there is Mark, who is a teacher from Wyvern School. Four Wyvern staff came over and spent a month with me. Brilliant. Good on them. And this little lady is Joy. Now, Joy has a condition called cerebral palsy. Um, lots of factors involved in it, but it's very common in Kenya, mainly through lack of support at birth. They can't afford to go to hospital. It's too far. The hospital's just not there. And um, lack of oxygen at birth. Joy, when we found her, was unable to move anything except her hands. And her face, she would smile. Joy was the most perfect name for this little lady. Anyway, through the work of um, Mark here and, and the other staff from Wyvern, um, oh yeah, sorry, I should just show you just to the extent of her disability. It's not just physical, it's learning as well, but physical predominantly. But also, here we go again, Georgia and Rachel. Uh, Alice is here as well, in the pool, trying to suss out what can be done. And things could be done. Now, this is the wonderful power of education. Georgia taught Joy's grandmother how to teach Joy, how to coach Joy to help her support her own weight and walk. Um, Joy's mother had died some years before. Her father had to go to work, and so she spent her day with her grandmother. And I just love this next picture. This is Joy taking her first ever steps. It's just incredible. She's running now and talking apparently um and doing well in her life she's going to school every day and um well this this is brings me immense joy for joy and for god and what god can do but the power of education if it's supplied if people are given the opportunity a few others that i work with quinson here Mary, Mary was at age 42 um, and again, had well, she didn't know anybody. She'd hardly met anyone in her life. It's her sister hiding behind her who looked after her but didn't want to be in the picture. Mary basically lived with a cow, <laughs> but not anymore. She's got friends now. She goes to school every day and um, she's getting out there and socialising. She's only got one eye, as you can see, and those teeth, goodness only knows where they come. She hasn't got any of her own teeth and so someone found these which don't fit. But what a character. Anyway, something else that we did, as well as Donna Kelly, we set up an outreach program for profound and multiple disabilities. And we were able to make a link with Chagoria Hospital. And all these things you see mentioned here are now in place and have been for some time. The main one being education for families. Lots of support given to families and the children, but educating the families how they can support their own. And with that, as I said, big part of it was to try and change the attitude in the community. And I was able to spread this across a big wide community. And we were able to coordinate and help people with disabilities to empower themselves to take political action and actually stand up for their rights. And it has happened. It really has happened. There's been a big change. And as I said earlier about Chagoria Hospital, here's something Rachel, my niece, ever so proud of this. She's initiated the idea of a mental health ward. Big problems with people's mental health, despite the happiness amongst children. Um, problems with alcohol and drugs and goods, like anyone, I suppose. But there's now a very active and thriving ward uh, and outreach programme for people with mental illness. 
I did a lot of work in schools, as I said earlier, taught various different subjects. This is me and Wiru again, but I taught, taught in something like 30 different schools moving around. I was also able to train the teachers. The teaching when I got there was appalling. It was chalk and talk. And, you know, the, although the kids didn't seem to mind, they just loved going to school and they just worked so hard, but tried to teach the teachers some different ways uh, of teaching and learning. And I was able to, with not on my own, but we set up internet capability for Wuru School. And I taught ICT classes both to the students, as you see in this picture, but also the adults. And we had quite a lot of us. I was running classes, afternoons, evenings, everything, including the chief and his wife. The local chief, what a great guy he was. He wasn't like the biggest fighter in the district. He was elected, but he was an African chief. And it was brilliant. And he learned, I taught him how to use Microsoft Word and PowerPoint and Excel and Access and, and how to do Google search and stuff. It was great. Okay. And I, as I said earlier, got involved with music competitions, dance competitions, loved it. And I did a lot with Guitari School, including they begged me to make them chips. They'd never, ever had chips. And so I bought a job lot of potatoes and organised a bring a knife to school day. Would you believe it? Of course, they would never, ever dream of sticking a knife in another person. They just use it to cut fruit and here on that day to peel the potatoes and slice them up into chips we fried them in great big pots over open fires health and safety forget it and the chips were awful because i bought the wrong sort of potato but it didn't matter look at their faces they loved it like they loved just about everything in their lives and I was able to support a ladies' football club. I coached and, and, and uh, sponsored them. And we won the league. It was great. And I got those shirts off eBay for, for a, a, a killing. Okay. So I went over with various ideas. Um, before I went, someone I used to respect came up with this awful statement. Let Darkie look after himself. Rubbish. We, we're part of the human race. We look after each other. And the particularly these people with profound and multiple disabilities, I really believe, are the most vulnerable people on the entire planet. They cannot speak for themselves. Their families have historically hidden them away and are ashamed of them and don't speak up for them. Their communities have snubbed them and the world generally just not know that they even exist. I think this is changing, but it's a real issue. So immediately, I was able to help. Obviously, we set up the school, got kids into school. We are providing mattresses and food and nappies and outreach and, and the work with the hospital. And beyond that, the hospital, as I was already said, there are now three units and a lot more kids being, uh, being taught, having the opportunity to go into school, the outreach programmes. And the dream for the further future, which hasn't happened, but I still, still pray for this, uh, there was a wonderful institute set up by Italian Christians for adults with profound difficulties and I wanted to bring the two together to make it a lifelong support for those who have the more profound disabilities. Still pray for that. The overarching aim though, sustainability. Yeah, great, someone like me going over there and, and the people that came with me and others, great, but what really needs is that the community can support itself. Of course, that's easy to say, hard to do with the levels of poverty unbelievable shortage of things but the people you see in the pictures i won't name them but amazing wonderful local kenyan people who do so much good and continue to do so and they they step up to the breach there's a lot going on it's great yeah and uk citizens they came over and worked with me i just put this in really because people can do this you maybe one day can do this and just as an exemplar of sort of things, this is the shamba that I lived in for the latter part of my time in Kenya. Um, I rented this and, um, the, the, for the family you see with me in the picture. Uh, Phineas there with his little kid who, who I've continued to support. Anyway, this shamba, I, I had it refurbished. A new roof, a new floor, a new kitchen, a bathroom, which hadn't been one before, uh, furnishings. Guess how much this would cost in the UK? How many tens of thousands of pounds? Hundreds, perhaps? Cost me 900 quid. <laughs> but 
um, and it's still there, although it's lived in by Kenyan people because I've, for various reasons, have decided not to go back. But this wonderful chamber is right on the edge of the Mount Kenya National Park, which is a World Heritage Site. I would pick my breakfast off the trees in the morning. I would watch the sun go down over the peak of Mount Kenya in the evening. Um, often have visitors have elephant come into the garden. It was the most beautiful place to live. Stunning. I said about Wyvern School staff. There's Martin with, with, with um, Dennis. So big questions. I had big questions. I came back and to be honest with you, I had a tough time in my life when I came back. I had to think about myself and my future, what and how. But I ask you to think about these things as well. Because maybe in the future, maybe you can do something, something like this, something better than this. With your skills, whatever they may be, with your education, whatever it may be. But more importantly, with your love and, and, and your, Christian, your Christian faith. Joy is a joy. There are many examples of this. It's not because of me. It's because of many people, but God working through us. So I finish with this. What makes life special for me, for you? There are many things, of course, but the things that I believe for me really matter. One is passion, really caring, not just being sorry for people or knowing about things, actually getting off backside and doing something about it. Meaning, your life has to have meaning. You are important. I'm important. We're all important to each other and to God. And we need to to take that meaning and create purpose so we can achieve things in our lives, things that matter, not just for ourselves. Yes, for ourselves and for our families, of course, but also in a broader level. And with God's love in our hearts, there's nothing we cannot achieve. So I ask you to think about this, please, and, uh, and pray for me and pray for yourself and perhaps where your future might take you. Thank you.